Whether the message is controlled growth, taking public transit, or composting instead of burning, local initiatives can add up to real change. Community organizations can bring political pressure to bear on governments, and there are many guides and resources available to help get them started. Canadian West Coast Environmental Law is BC's legal champion for the environment. In September 2006, it published the Clean Air Bylaw Guide. One of the, the real needs that was identified uh, was the need to have uh, a resource, a book that brought this all together, all the information together into one place. So that's really what we were trying to do uh, on the issue of, of what local governments can do uh, through their bylaw powers. The guide grew out of a realization that municipalities are not always aware of their own powers. It's difficult for municipalities to always understand fully all the tools that are available to them. So in the course of my conversation, for example, with one municipal official, he was quite surprised, he was welcoming of the guide and was very surprised to find out that um, municipalities had the jurisdiction to address air quality issues. He thought predominantly it was a provincial issue. Air agencies run monitoring stations throughout the Georgia Basin Puget Sound region. Like this station in Darrington, Washington. Well, this is the PM2.5 filter sampler, and I'm exchanging filters in the sampler. This station monitors the amount of particulates in the Darrington air. This particular device is called an ethylometer, and it measures black carbon. Black carbon is the product of any combustion pollution source. Uh, what we mean by that is either like a diesel engine, for instance, or a wood smoke wood stove, for instance, is another example. That information is then uh, fed through a connection to our data logging system. That information then goes into a database back in our home office in Seattle. It's rare that we see concentrations this high in the Puget Sound area. Uh, Darrington is a mountain valley when we have stable air, meaning there's an inversion and, and the air doesn't move, wood smoke doesn't take long for it to pollute the air. The data the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency collects is used to develop policy guidelines. These guidelines help planners, elected officials, and other decision makers design air and climate friendly communities. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing is characterizing the air pollution that's in our community and then uh, analyzing it to see what the sources are and then determining what the strategies are that are going to be most effective. Some of the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency's policy suggestions include discouraging wood burning in densely populated areas, avoiding incompatible land uses, and limiting people's exposure to air pollution through the planning and zoning decisions they make. Every community is different and every community has uh, different needs and, and a different uh, situation. So uh, rather than us coming in with a pre-planned template for action, uh, the first step for us is to learn about that community and work with community leaders and really try and understand uh, what will work in that community as opposed to having preconceptions about how to approach it. Municipalities, as it turns out, have a lot of power. Here in Mill Creek, north of Seattle, city officials have imposed several policies aimed at making sure people have cleaner air to breathe. One of its first decisions dealt with the issue of wood smoke. We believe that having wood burning stoves and wood burning fireplaces in a residential community um, is not in the best interest of the community at large. And that's what we're planning for as people. And our charge under the the state constitution is to ensure that we protect the health, safety, and general welfare of the population. And we're interpreting that in terms of air quality to have a prohibition on, on wood stoves. Municipalities have the power to change uh, elements of the environment. You have the responsibility to um, do what you can to ensure that that's, the community matures, that it matures in an environmentally responsible way. And that's a responsibility that, that I think land use planners take very, very seriously. Municipalities can also lead by example. 
Six BC municipalities are using biodiesel fuel in their vehicle fleets over the next five years, as are many in Washington. They can adopt eco-friendly procurement policies, purchasing goods that will minimize air emissions such as recovered and recycled building materials, bio-based oils and solvents, inks and coatings. And ultimately, Canadian municipalities can pass legally binding bylaws. Vancouver, for instance, has an anti-idling bylaw. Residents are fined $50 if they leave their vehicles idling for more than three minutes. Kelowna prohibits backyard burning within its city limits. So do Gibsons and Seashelt, a result, as we have seen, of community pressure on local government. We found there were a lot of people on our side, and as soon as you have some strength in numbers, um, that, that helped enormously. But the movement is slow. I mean, I'm, we're not going to sort of say that our actions have actually translated into huge successes. We have two major successes, but we're still fighting the same old battle. Local government is often the first line of attack because it gets other governments involved. Kelowna Mayor Sharon Shepard chairs a multi-level advisory board that determines policy for the entire Okanagan Valley. Well, it's been recognized that uh, the air quality boundaries are, are way beyond our own boundaries. Why couldn't there be a bylaw that says you use a vacuum instead of a blower to reduce the dust and uh, improve air quality? Although its nucleus consists of elected officials and representatives of various ministries, the policies it develops are a result of public input and town hall meetings. Smoke was the number one uh, issue, and from burning, uh, from backyard burning, from uh, forestry burning, uh, agriculture burning, transportation was the next uh, issue. We have uh, been allocated gas tax money and with that money comes the opportunity to put it towards something green and we've all agreed that transit is where we should be putting investing the money local initiatives such as this work we've learned that the establishment of local committees that can bring together a variety of different stakeholders around the same table to sort of say what can we do to improve our air quality results in improvements in air quality collectively and individually we are making progress our vehicles are cleaner, we're using more public transit, and there are limitations on backyard burning. But there is still work to be done. The responsibility for improving air quality rests with all of us. Uh, now that can be on an individual basis about doing what we can to reduce uh, our vehicle use, uh, use public transport, uh, bicycles, whatever that we can do to reduce contribution to the air. We now realize that people individuals are, are playing an increasingly important role and this poses great greater challenges to cleaning up the air. It's not quite so simple as knocking on the industry's door and filing a petition or a suit. Everybody's responsible. Whether we're uh, Canadians or Americans, uh, we live in an air shed and we all have a responsibility to ensure that uh, uh, we can breathe the cleanest air possible. You know, the devil's in the detail, and it's the little things that, that will have an outcome to be very positive in the future.